In a previous study, I addressed mythologies in part on the Greek school by considering its treatment by the rhetors that wrote the pre-gnosmatic treatises and their presence in the repertoire of model exercises of pro for their use by teachers and pupils, attributed without much evidence to the great rhetor Leibanius of Antioch. All of which has yet more merit when it is considered that the teaching of mythology, which was so essential in a culture such as the Greco-Roman one, did not have an actual subject in the schematic curriculum of studies in the Greek school, but instead had to be taught within the context of the text's exegesis. At the same time, this serves to show within the framework of this interesting symposium on the genealogy of popular science that I have been kindly invited to attend, uh, the broad diversity of the ways of accessing scientific knowledge and its popularization. On this occasion, my investigation into the impact mythology had in the Greek school will focus on the other side of the coin, on the school exercises themselves. We are not going to be dealing here with the difficulties often entail in the identification of classroom material among the papyri or something so seemingly straightforward as the distinction between an exercise produced by a pupil and the work of a teacher. For this miracle of recovery to take place, even 2,000 years after they were produced, we have had to pass through two centuries of exploring, funding, and publishing papyri and other forms of written media, little wood tablets, ostraca, and parchments, preserved by the dry sands of the Egyptian desert, a cultural milieu in which Greco-Roman teaching had been introduced as in the metropolis since its conquest by Alexander the Great. It has also been extremely useful for this study to have been able to refer to a repertoire now theoretically complete of the myriad prognosmatic exercises preserved on papyri and other media. I am referring to the one recently forthcoming by Cristina Iturralde in her PhD dissertation under my supervision. This material belongs to a stage of schooling, transitioning between the class of grammaticos akin to our secondary education, for example, and the higher education of the rhetor, and is by far the more expressive from the perspective of mythology. I shall introduce and comment on the mythological data, organizing it not as is usually done in the respective treatises by gods, heroes, cycles, or specific divinities, which would lead to a highly systematic outcome given the often scarce and random representativeness of the surviving papyrus material, but instead by following the order the prognosmata tend to adopt in the retort treatises. Furthermore, this will allow to distinguishing the best and worst represented exercises accordingly and explaining the reason for those differences, as well as the numerous coincidences and divergences regarding the list of prognosmata attributed to Leibanios, which despite the gaps, is the most complete surviving to this day. A simplified list of the prognosmata postulated by the rhetors consists of the following, fable, mythos in Greek, so fabula in Latin, narration, diegema, hreia, hreia is like an anecdote, gnome, refutatio, confutatio, in Greek, anaskeue, kataskeue, commonplace, koinos topos in Greek, encomion, invective, psogos in Greek, syncresis, so comparatio in Latin, ethopoeia, an exercise of characterization of uh, personage and so on, ekphrasis, thesis, and proposal of law. Of these, the exercise is identified in the classroom material, uh, whether these are isolated exercises or the most common anthologies of exercises, sometimes corresponding to a school books, are as follows. Fable, Hreia, Gnome, 
encomium, comparison, ethopoeia, ekphrasis with doubts, emphasis with doubts. Of this, the fable here and nome are by far the best represented, followed at some distance by the encomium and ethopoeia. The papyrus prognosmata that to a greater or lesser extent contain mythological references and not historical or other ones are four fables, three hreiai, six gnomai, eight encomiums or set of encomiums, 23 ethopoeiae or set of ethopoeiae, and a possible ekphrasis out of a total or 22 exercises of fable, two of hreia, five of nomi, nine of encomium, one of syncresis, four of ethopoeia, and one of ekphrasis, of ekphrasis, plus 54 partial anthologies of some of these exercises. The myths allude to may involve the Olympian gods and other divinities, heroes of the Trojan cycle, specifically heroes and heroines from the Iliad and pre or post Iliad, and to a much lesser degree from the Odyssey, some metamorphoses, as well as elements from Hesiodic and Argive, Attic, and Thessalian mythology, as well as some biblical stories. Some of these myths coincide with the content in the school models attributed to Libanius, or the few adduced by the treatise written by his disciple Aptonius, although the majority do not coincide, and those that do so do not occur in the same type of exercise. As in Libanius' models, nonetheless, here too, the models often have a moral sense, or at least an simplifying one. I shall now provide a list of them, dedicating more time to those cases of greater import from a mythological perspective or in the best condition of preservation. Out of the four fable exercises with mythological references found on Papyrus, one, Papyrus Kuln 6250, from the between uh, second and third century, contains a reference to the fates, another, Tabulae Karatae Ascendertianan 86 uh, from 3rd uh, century AD, a folder of little wooden tablets from Palmyra, to the mother of the gods, another Papyrus Amers 2, 2 6 from 3rd, 4th century, a Greek version of a, Latin of a Latin fable, to the Meter series, and the most interesting one, Tabuloi Karatae Ascendertianan 86, places its, its cautionary tale in the mouth of Her Hermes. Out of the three papyrus Hreiae with mythological references, two are adjudicated to Diogenes, with one, Papyrus Vindobonensis G29946, from uh, uh, between second and third century, including a comparison with Pelops and Enomaus, and the other, Papyrus Rainer, 332 uh, from the second century, a reference to Autolicus and Hermes in the Autolicus by Euripides. The third Hreia is an Ostracon, Ostracon Thompson from third, fourth century, uh, provenient maybe from Thebes in Egypt, contains a highly didactic reference to the Muses, according to which, when Diogenes was asked where the Muses lived, he replied in the soul of educated people, so pepai deumenoi in Greek, which is a very, a very expressive uh, uh, term. Out of the six mythological gnomae found in a school material, one, Papyrus Cairo, inventory 56226, from between first and third century, uh, asks, why did Prometheus, who is said to be the one that gave form a question that, thanks to its complete transmission by Stobeos, we now continue to us and all other living creatures, give animals a single nature to each one according to their species, and by contrast, it is understood human beings are so complex. Tugnomai, Papyrus Chiron, uh, from, uh, um, uh, from uh, between 1st and 3rd century from Osirincus, and Ostracon Berolinensis, Inventory 12319, 
dating from uh, third, between third and second century BC, uh, uh, no less, from Philadelphia, referred to Zeus. One as Zeus is the one that sends our daily breath. The other, paraphrasing the saying, the rain Zeus sends never pleases everyone. Of the two adjudicated to Menander, from among the many maxims attributed to him, one, Papyrus Vindobonensis G, 1999, uh, from first century AD, uh, on slender, refers to the Attic myth of Hippolytus and Theseus. Another, Papyrus Gissing 3, 4, 8, urges the young man to flee from Dionysus and further so from Aphrodite. Another nomi, Papyrus Burion, 1, 1, 1, for 1, from uh, uh, 4th century, predicates that Eros is the oldest of all the gods, following Theogony's declaration, verse 120. Out of the eight exercises, or as appropriate, the series of exercises of encomium with a mythological content identifying papyrus, one, papyrus Köln 7286, from between second and third century, is in place of Dionysus. Another, papyrus Osirincus 7, 1015 uh, of Hermes, and another, papyrus Osirincus, 17 is in place of the fig, containing references to Hermes and Dionysus, besides the sweet voice of the ancient sage Nestor from the Iliad. A papyrus dating back to such an early time as the third century BC has passed down fragments of an anthology of texts whose schematics and formulaic nature have led to their identification as sundry prognosmatic encomiums, which are assumed to be examples proposed by the teacher for their subsequent completion by the pupils. They are dedicated to Minos, presented as the mythical founder of the Thalassocracy, Thalassocracy and the Greek islands, and upon his death, a fair church of Adernus. Radamanthus, like the former son of Zeus, with the special circumstance of the gods' predilection for Crete, the hero's place of birth, where Zeus was also born, and to where he took his beloved Europa. And Tydeus, as a member of the expedition of the Seven against Thebes, son-in-law of the giant king Adastos, delivered from the threat arising from 50 cities, and in personal terms, friend to his companions, a particularly exemplary fat fought school children. He is also characterized with the no less exemplary values of good diplomatic attributes, a clever compensation, no doubt, for the educational shortcomings he was attributed by mythical tradition. Loved by the gods, and in particular by Athena, himself and his offspring, Diomedes. This exercise <coughs> may have been followed by another dedicated to Diomedes himself. Another encomiastic exercise, the so-called Flower of Antinos, is part of what has been classified as an anthology of school sketches from a later period, between 2nd and 3rd century, in this case not only of encomiums, as in the previous anthology, but of Sandri Prognasmata, Papyrus, Milanese Boiano, 120 from Teptunis. It contains comparative references to a series of plant divinities now for being the object of infatuation of heroes or gods, Heracles, Dionysus, the nymphs, and Apollo, dying young and metamorphosing as deities into plants, namely Hylos, Crocus, Cypress, Narcissus, and Hyacinthus. An encomium to Antinos, Papyrus of Syrincus 50, from 3rd, 4th century, the beloved of the Emperor Hadrian, in this case a contemporary character, and yet the subject of sundry poetic texts, contains references to Hermes, the Muses, Zeus, and Leto. An encomium to Achilles, with mandatory references to Zeus, Eacos, Peleus, Thetis, and Chiron, 
among others, alternate with an ethopoeia of Clitemnestra addressing Orestes at the moment the latter is going to kill her. In a Papyrus Prose anthology, Papyrus Vindobonensis G, 29789, as opposed to the usual use of the hexameter in a school ethopoeia on Papyrus, and according to the common practice in the models of the repertoire of Provinasmata attributed to Livanios or in the samples provided by Aftonios. A later encomium to Colusus refers to a hero in the Odyssey, Alcinos, in another Papyrus anthology, Papyrus Cairo Maspero 267187, from 6th century, found in the archives of the notary and teacher of uh, uh, of the notary and teacher Dioscoros or Dioscoros of Aphrodito, and written in Antinopolis, in which it alternates with an ethopoeia on the relationship between Achilles and Polyxena. Likewise, the subject of another papyrus ethopoeia from the same archive, Papyrus Cairo, Maspero 267186. Finally, an encomium to the huge do Dominus with an acrostic, a very typical school game, as we shall see in due course, from that same archive belonging to Dioscorus, includes references to Orpheus, son of Calliope, and to Nestor, and alternates with an ethopoeia of Achilles following his death caused by Polyxena, whereby among the school uh, papyrus of Dioscorus, we encounter the application of the encomium to contemporary personages. And on the other hand, insistence on the subject of Polyxena as the object of an ethopoeia. A similar number of cases to those cited, cited corresponds to the exercises of ethopoeia with mythological content identified on papyrus or other kinds of media, with the advantage that among them there are several examples in an acceptable stage of preservation. Following the same chronological order of the casuistry basically usable with the other exercises, I shall begin with the oldest example that has survived to this day, which is at the same time the best preserved, because in contrast to all the other cases, it is precisely the only one we have on a stone, Inscriptione Graecae 14, 2012, and not on papyrus or any other of the writing materials used at the school. This is so because the composition was written by an 11-year-old Roman boy, Quintus Sulpicio, Sulpicius Maximus, for a school competition on, on extempore Greek verse against the backdrop of the great Capitoline Games held in Rome in 94 uh, year AD, reign of Domitian. The child won the prize and then, following his premature death, his parents had the poem engraved on both sides of the niche containing a statue of the boy on the funerary stele they dedicate to him. The poem is of considerable interest for many reasons, none of which, by the way, is far from the spirit of this symposium. It is an example of the existence of competitions that, even from the classroom, foster not only the literary application of proginasmatic teaching, but also the oral, nat the oral nature, if not of the composition itself, at least of its reception and literary dissemination at such, at such an advanced date as the end of the first century. It also testifies to the preponderance, still at that time, of Greek over Latin as the language of schooling and culture in Rome, an issue that the great rhetor Quintilian felt the need to oppose in favor of teaching Latin. Apart from being the oldest surviving example, it is the only case of a school ethopoeia outside Egypt, and not precisely in Greece, but instead in Rome, the great heir, heir of its culture and system of teaching. This shows if there were actually any need to do so, that proginasmatic practice is a genuine part of Greek teaching and not something specifically, specifically linked to the coloni coloni colonialized Egypt, Egypt as an instrument of acculturation, as has sometimes been suggested 
by ignoring the ethopoeia of Sulpicius. From the viewpoint is mythological content, the exercise with the engraving containing 43 hexameters refers to the words assumedly spoken by Zeus to Helios after the latter had let his own fire tongue dry his chariot around the earth and through his inexperience had set it on fire. The subject, also well known, neither belongs to the type of mythology most commonly found in the classroom, which is Homeric, nor has it been addressed in any other of the prominasmata, either of pupils or of rhetors, that we know of, whereby it has a certain originality within the context of these testimonies. An important feature of its treatment by Sulpicius in terms of didactic exemplarity is the monumental reprimand that the furious Zeus gives Helios for surrendering to his young son, foolish wing, and for devastating effects the stupid plank had for the entire cosmos, as well as the threat Zeus makes to have Helios take up the reins and the straight path of his chariot. Another school, Ethopoeia, belonging to the same anthology of prognosmatic sketches as the aforementioned flower of Antinos, Papyrus Milanese Boyano 120, is likewise of interest from the perspective of its, of its mythical content, not so much because of the hero uh, it refers to, Heracles, who is well represented in the retros prognosmatic as we see, not worthy above all because of the particular and at the same time ingenious version that the Thopoeia sketch provides of the words Heracles would say to the Leucinian officer, Dadujos, that allegedly tried to impede his initiation into the mysteries. Facing with his refusal, Heracles hotly replies that he has been initiated into more important mysteries uh, he has enjoyed a night with Cori, Persephone, the goddess of the underworld, which implies upsetting the usual order of events of the Heraclea myth, which play his descent in the underworld at the end of everything, preceding his feat uh, of madness. One prognosmatic testimony, Papyro Rylands 3487 from the uh, 4th century, is remarkable for something that is relatively scarce in school papyri and to a lesser extent in the retros models, namely references to the subject matter of the Odyssey compared to the preponderance of testimonies involving the Iliad. It contains an identified exercise with allusions to characters from the Odyssey, Circe, Polyphemus, and Amalthea, and fragments apparently of anethopoeia for which the title has been reconstructed, Hesios' words after being inspired by the Muses, as well as the beginning and end of its 24 hexameters. It has subsequently been discovered how the beginning of this concealed something no less appetizing for scholars as we have already seen, namely an acrostic consisting of the Homeric hemistic de apameivomenos prosefe. The text contains references to the mythology of the Theogony, Helicon, divine lineages, wars between giants, the Aeas, lineages of heroes and, uh, heroes and women, and works and days, Zeus, as the subject of an original canto in which the author announced he has passed no from a shepherd to an, uh, uh, an aoidos, as described by the preface to the Theogonic narrative, but from pastoral poet to urban poet, according to the particular aesthetics of the Hellenistic era. A certain anthology of Ethopoeia, Papyrus Graves, from the, between 4th and 6th century, perhaps from Thebes, is interesting because of the originality of the topics addressed in its titles. What would Calliope say to console Thetis? 
What would Odysseus say when ordering Menelaus not to bury Ajax corpse? What would Thiop say when Erisicton spent his entire fortune and was still not satisfied? Apollo's words following the massacre of Niobe's children, and also for, th for the mythical allusions contained on the papyrus surviving fragments. Another Ethopoeia anthology on papyrus, <coughs> Papyrus Heidelberg Inventory 1271, between, uh, from between 3rd and 6th century, is not worth precisely because of the ingenuity of its six composition within the Iliadic or the pre-post-Iliadic subject matter, which uh, with such brevity and charm that to some extent they remind us of epigrams, a genre with which in fact the hesymetric ethopoeia was confused until its identification as Provinasma. The titles in this case express in shortened form as if in fact they were actually little poems, are Phoenix, during the embassy, seeking to convince Achilles to set aside his anger, based on asking him idly whether the centaur Chiron did not teach him to fight so that now he has led to express anger over a girl. Another title is A Greek Woman Encountering Helen in Greece, challenging, challenging her indignantly and with some insistence over how she has the goal to present herself there after causing the death of so many Greeks. Another title is A Greek After Hector Had Killed Patroclus and Bearing His Arms reminding him that he will have to face Achilles on the morrow. Another title is Zeus when Aphrodite comes to him, railing against Diomedes because he injured her hand, reproaching her for concerning herself with matters of war instead of her injuring herself with her own darts. Another title is Aphrodite when Diomedes is injured by Aegeali, a post-Homeric subject although clearly connected to the previous one. And uh, another one, when Agamemnon fails to add Orestes, with references to Menelaus and Iphigenia. A diptych, H. Uh, 38, uh, from Cairo, made it all good, contains, alternating with a nomi by Menander, seven verses of an eidolopoeia, subtype of the thopoeia pronounced by imaginary veins, in which the spectre of Achilles, following the end of the Trojan War, addresses his fellow, his fellow countrymen as they embark for Hellas, reproaching them for hastening away without giving him his part of the spoils and alluding to Plato's nocturnal fate. Uh, finally, among the surviving school papyri of Dioscorus of Aphrodito, there is likewise an example, Papyrus Cairo Maspero 267188, of a prognosmatic subject that is also very enlightening, even though it is not Homeric and is double in this case, being an ethopoeia by Apollo to his two beloved, Hyacinthus and Daphne, at the same time. To conclude, the mythological content of the prognosmatic exercise preserved on papyri and other writing materials constitute a highly important complement, both in quantity and in variety, to the mythical wealth provided by the repertoire of prognosmatic models attributed to Laivanius, the respective prognosmatic examples of his disciple Aftonius, and the sundry data handled by the Retos with the particularity that the papyrus testimonies and others provide a direct testimony of a school practice in the handling of, mythic, of mythical material. The myths alluded to may refer to the Olympian gods and other divinities, heroes of the, heroes of the Trojan cycle, specifically heroes and heroines of the Iliad and pre and post-Iliadic, 
and to a much lesser extent the Odyssey. Some metamorphoses, as well as in contrast to what is seen in theory and in the prognosmatic models, some Hesiodic mythology and Argy, Attic, and Thessalian mythology. And also, although I have not addressed this because it is beyond our scope here, some biblical stories. With what that implies in terms of the school exercises ability to assume contemporary subject matter. Some of the myths do indeed coincide with the content in school models attributed to Libanios or Aftonios, although the majority do not. And those that do indeed coincide do not share the same type of exercise. Nevertheless, as in the Libanios models, here too the myths often have a moral sense or at least an exemplification one. The treatment of the topics, however, although stylistically poorer, tends to better the models insofar as the particularity and inventiveness of their versions are concerned. Some ethopoe exercises share the same attitude of reproach and indignant questioning on the part of the person asking for criti criticisable attitudes to be explained which although a common feature in ethopoeia, by sometimes appearing group and exclusively can only suggest a didactic purpose in such an important, we might say, subgenre of the ethopoeia. As we have been seeing, the type of ethopoeia spoken over Sanguam's corpsing constitutes a numerous subgenre of the same. A very special case of a school ethopoeia is that addressed by Zeus to Helios for lending his chariot to his son Phaeton. It is special because of the specific myth involved and its didactic use. There are other points of interest in the test, none of which is any way far from the spirit of this symposium. It is proof of the existence of school competitions in the major public festivals with what that meant for stimulating learning, and also that this type of teaching was used from one corner to the other of the Hellenist Hellenized world, entering its continued presence in Europe down through the centuries. Thank you very much for your attention.